Good morning, Frank. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing? Doing very well. He's absolutely right. This this is riveting television. This this kind of stuff right here gets inside my head, and I can't let it go. I mean, I sit there and I think about it. I want to write about what you guys are going through on the swarm on on the CW. I mean, th- you really have an impact here. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I had the same experience when I read the novel. I wasn't quite sure a way into it, but it stayed with me. And what I wasn't expecting, you know, reading this novel five years ago, a lot of the things that um, are dramatized, I thought were just fantastic. The idea of whales sinking ships, orcas attacking boats, pathogens, unknown pathogens spreading around the world, killing people, uh, f- floods and tsunamis. Suddenly, all of the stuff that was fantasy is all happened in the last couple of years. So some of these events have caught up with us, which is not a good thing. Well, it's, it's you know, we've always had a fascination with the great body of water. And, and it's like when you have a show like this and you, you can you see that it can bite back. It's like now there's a new monster in our hearts. It, it's, it's that ocean. You know, it's interesting. And again, what I what I was interested in is that I did want to make a monster movie and I wanted to make a monster movie when you realize that the monster is us. You know, you feel very different about Someone asked me early on, how are you going to feel sympathy for this monster that's killing all these people? And I said, well, how do you feel about people who kill out of self-defense? You know, if you're protecting the people you love, the creatures you love, the world you love, that's very different uh, than being a But So I sort of approached it thinking, yeah, we need to understand that whatever the, the bad stuff that's happening, we brought it on ourselves. Yeah. The show we're talking about is The Swarm on the CW, and I really strongly suggest for listeners to get the CW app because, I mean, and you're not too late for this show. That's a, you, This way you can got, you know, jump into a binge watch because The Swarm is something that is going to create conversation. Do you guys have those conversations on the set? We have them on the set. Um, we actually, we obviously have them at the beginning. Yeah. But every time an actor comes, uh, you have the conversations again. And it's interesting. A lot of people... Um, you know, shared a belief that I had. Growing up, I was very much aware of the whole question about how much damage we're doing to the environment and to the earth. And I always took comfort in what scientists were saying was, yeah, no matter how much damage we do to the earth, the oceans are so vast, we can't really destroy them. And unfortunately, I think scientists now realize that's no longer true. We're at a point where we're really doing some pretty serious damage. As one of our characters says very simply, If the oceans die, we die. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the world we're facing right now and the world that we dramatize in, in the swarm. And isn't it odd how something like this is a, you know, a, basically a picture of, of our reality? I mean, it seems like Hollywood has always done that in a way that they will take reality, create a story, and then we start making a difference. But the thing is, just like the other day I asked somebody, I said, but is it too late? Can we really start making a difference? Well, I hope it's not too late. And one of the things when we made the drama, um, I just felt it was really important both for our main characters mm-hmm. and also for the audience not to lose hope. You know, if you watch a drama like this and you think, you know, we're screwed, that's it, there's nothing we can do, you come away giving up. And I didn't want our characters to give up. And I'm hoping the audience will think, um, you know, maybe we need to start thinking about this and hopefully it isn't too late and we can do something about it. How much of this is actually filmed on the water? Because we get to see a lot of water. Um, when you shoot on the water, there are three things you do and everything, every choice is predicated on how can you protect your crew and your actors. Yes. So when it's safe, you try always to shoot on a boat in the water. But those have to be very, very con- controlled conditions. Um, anytime that anything's underwater, by and large, anytime conditions are a little bit risky or there's stunts, you always do that in a tank. And you try to find a tank with a really big pool that you can replicate the climate. And then the last result for things that are particularly difficult to do or dangerous, you use visual effects or computer generated images. So it's those three tools that you have to create those scenes. Um, and they're very time consuming. They, anything on water takes about twice, if not three times as long as on land. Yeah, yeah. To take a book and to turn it into moving pictures, I mean, I can't imagine what, what that does inside your imagination because we all get our own interpretation of a story, but you're taking this story to a level to where we all understand and we're all picking up on the same thing. Well, for me, I, I, you know, fortunately, I hadn't read the novel um, when it was offered to me. And so, you know, as I read it a couple of times and 
I really thought there's a fascinating group of characters here. There's an interesting story and it really engaged. But I also realized two things, one of which I'm not a scientist. Um, you know, I didn't. La I lasted a week in chemistry. I don't think I made made it through a day in physics, uh, biology. I, you know, I took the minimum number of courses. So I realized that I had to make the science understandable to the an audience such as myself. So one of the things we did is we decided that instead of having a lot of world class scientists, mostly older men, um, who go through the novel, we decided to add a lot of younger characters. So our scientists are graduate students. Um, sort of in their teens, some in their 20s. So they're learning about science. They want to be scientists and they're very smart, but it means they can explain things to each other and explain it to the audience. The other thing I wanted to do was to really find a group of characters right from the first that we could follow. So you could you could um, tell their stories as well. So it's the same sort of a way into any story as you just try to engage a story, you try to engage an audience emotionally, um, be provocative with some of the ideas and hope they come along for the ride. One of the things that always fascinates me as a viewer and a fan of shows like this is the fact that timing and the pause are so important to me because I'll sit there in one of those pauses where the camera gets to speak and nobody else is and all of a sudden you go, yes, I'm feeling it now. So how important is that pause to you? Um, for me, it's incredibly important and I've always been attracted to material where those pauses are very important. Um, I like reaction shots. Yeah. I like the audience to feel what the audience, what the characters. And I think there's great when you have really quick dialogue, but again, in a show that's very visual, where people are trying to make sense of the world, whether it's Rome and we're trying to introduce people to that world, Game of Thrones, introduce all the new characters and worlds, reaction shots tell you a lot. So the reaction shots are for characters, they're thinking about it, which gives a moment for the audience to think about it and watch and observe. Mm. Eight episodes. Do you like that kind of storytelling? Because we've become addicted to that these days. I mean, we'll complain about a three-hour movie, but boy, you give me eight episodes, I'm going to watch every one of them. You know, I think it all depends on the material. I think we've all had the experience also of being halfway through a series and saying, wow, this is just going on for too long, wishing it would speed up. We've all seen movies where we think, I wish we had another hour or two. So I I think if it's if the story suggests that it can be spread out over a number of episodes, enough characters, enough of a plot. Sometimes you just run out of story. And um, I think I think for me, eight hours was probably just the right length for this. Yeah, yeah. As, as the leader of this creative team, did you get to break it down? In other words, when it was time to really start putting this together, I keep a defrag journal where I ask the questions and I question the answers, and I'm able to build by that, me uh, that measure. How, how do you build something as big as this? You know, I, um, I always compare a little bit to what I do to, you know, basically a coach of a sports team or a conductor for an orchestra. You assemble a really good group of players, musicians. You sort of present them the beginning idea, you know, what's the goal? And then you put your heads together and just ask all the questions. You figure out all the moves together and you try to figure out a game plan um, to get on the screen um, what's in your mind and what's your imagination. So it's really about that collective effort to get everybody, you know, playing on the same team, playing the same score. And it takes a long time. I think we worked about three and a half, almost four years on this mm. to get it right. Also, there's a lot of research. I mean, the science was changing um, a lot since the novel's been written. And as I said, we wanted to make sure we had enough science to make things explicable, but not have any more that was necessary. Well, how do you deal with those moments where you've got those that say, come on, let's get on with this project. Come on, come on. But yet you've got you've got to be able to be that anchor saying, whoa, hold on. I'm going over here to get a little bit more research to make sure that we get this pretty much right. You know, for me, um, filmmaking is very fluid. There are people out there who think that you want to have a, a lock script, that every word has to be perfect before you start. I've always thought some really interesting things happen once you start pre-production, once you start shooting. So I try to put together a plan and a budget and a schedule so that if things happen, you're shooting episode one, some interesting things happen between the characters, some other people bringing thoughts so you can adjust as you go along. Then in post-production, it's amazing how much rewriting, how much restructuring you do. So for me, it's a continual process. There's never until 
it's uh, it's locked. Um, it's never done. And unfortunately, I rarely go back and watch things after I finish them because all I do is sit there and think, yep. well, I wish I'd done it differently. It could have been better. So you know, there's, I'm, it's really hard for me to walk away. But when I walk away, I just think, okay, that's it. I, we've done the best we can. And yeah, it's now other people to... Uh, to pass judgment on us. One of my favorite things is the post-production. I call that the fermenting period because it's fermented a little bit and you, you've kind of disconnected from that moment. So when you go in there to do post-production, it's like, okay, now we have fresh eyes. Let's go ahead and let's build this story. Yeah, you do. And it's great. I mean, as you know, you know, you've gone from the set with 400 people to a dark room with three or four people, yeah. you know, it's the same thing with the composer, with the people doing the graphics, you have very controlled, environments very intense work and it's such a relief and it's also creatively very engaging because again people come in as you say with a fresh shy and you sort of say okay this is what we shot but what do how do we now take this material and what do we do with it so uh it's a little i always think that we have when you're in the editing room you have all the ingredients but you haven't baked it yet you talk about the composer and you've talked about music a little bit earlier. I mean, you took that very seriously. So many times people will just go to the nearest production library, grab some music and slam it in there. But but you you physically built original music for this, did you not? Very much so. It's something um, it's something that I always did. And also, I was very fortunate. You know, I produced a lot of shows for HBO and uh, the executives at HBO believed that music was actually essential. Mm-hmm. So... I was fortunately to, you know, train, work, um, and get a lot of experience working with composers. I like, I love what composers do. And, you know, you said also about those moments of silence and observation. Sometimes music fills in those moments and does things that no dialogue can do. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, for me, it's an integral part. And um, I try to make sure we, I leave enough time for the composers to work. I bring them in sometimes quite early yeah. so they can test out themes. I send them some of the footage we've shot, but yeah, no, it's something that, um, you know, I, I know certainly experience from a number of people have come up to me and talked about the scores for Rome and John Adams and game of Thrones and how integral, uh, those scores were to, uh, the success of the shows. See, the quality of The Swarm on CW is, to me, this is movie-style quality. It's not one of those where you're shooting an independent film, you only had 19 hours to get something done. I mean, you physically put yourself into this. Very much so. Yeah, I think, again, it was, well, yeah, I did, and so did all the uh, 400 people that came on board. It was, I think, you know, because of the nature of the material, um, people were very invested in it. I mean, we all... It's interesting when we were shooting a lot of the scenes, you know, it was really, we, we would go and we'd scout some of these locations, beautiful beaches in Italy and places. And then some days we'd go back and they were knee deep in trash, depending on the tide. So we had this experience of actually living what the show was about. Um, you know, it was coming out of the pandemic. Yeah. So again, the idea that there are these pathogens out there that can kill people. So it was quite, it, there was a direct connection with the material going into it, why we were shooting. Um, you know, again, some days we would go and we'd see sort of schools of dead fish floating mm. because of the remnants of an oil spill. So, yeah, it was a very, people did throw themselves in because I think they really, yeah, found an emotional connection to the material that, you know, brought out the best in them and certainly made them want to work as hard as they could. Now, Frank, how did you prepare your heart for this? When you see dead fish and you see an ocean full of trash like that, it would make me sick or I would I would just fall to my knees and just say, what can we do? How did you stay so strong? Um, you know, I think, well, unfortunately, I half of the time I do what I think a lot of people do is you decide not to think about it. I think if if I think if I spent all of my time thinking about the degradation of the environment of the seas, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. Right. So part of it is just being trying not to think about it. But there are those moments um, when it really is overwhelming. And we also did something very interesting on this project, which I think gave us a little bit of um, a focus of what we could do. We wanted to be a green production. There are a lot of things that you can do on a production, simple things like you get you don't use plastic bottles. Anybody who's been on a set, you can see you go through, you can go through tens of thousands of bottles of water. Um, you use too many generators, too many vehicles. So we wanted to be the there's a 
protocol published about for green projects. And we just thought we're making an environmental show. So the fact that everybody there, we were sticking to this protocol, it made us feel we were very proactive in our own small way, but we came out with a really good green rating. It was very satisfying when we, you know, we, we submitted our production reports, we talked to the authorities, the consultants, and they gave us a great rating. So I think we all came away thinking, wow, we actually filmed, produced in a way we have never done before. And I'd heard about this, we had talked about it, but I never sat down and thought about it. And it was a little time consuming, a bit more expensive, but it certainly was worth it. And as I said, on this project, it was essential. And I think that was a little bit of a, a little bit of a um, antidote. I mean, you felt bad about what was going on. You thought, okay, at least I'm not making it worse. I'm trying to make it a little better. Yeah. Is there a side of your personality or your creative drive and love for this planet that maybe you'll team up with Discovery or National Geographics to start doing uh, regular documentaries? Because I mean, the, I can hear your passion. You know, I love documentaries, but I'm not a documentary filmmaker. Okay. And what I've always tried to do is to find projects that address the issues I feel strongly about um, in drama. So I think my contribution um, to uh, this the world of these type of environmental issues um, is really, you know, coming through stories. And I've got a couple of other projects where touch on this, but also in, in different ways. So I've always been intrigued by that from, and it also was part of the DNA when I started out with HBO. And I think I was really pleased that CW signed onto this and embraced it because I think it is really important for that audience to, you know, to experience something that they don't may not get from a documentary, which is watching our characters deal with this in a, a more emotional and personal way. I would love to see some numbers on people that are watching the swarm on CW in the way of how they're going to protect their own oceans. In other words, my ocean is this beautiful forest in South Charlotte that I've been fighting for since 1992. All of the animals have returned. And it's and, and so to hear you speak of the ocean that way, you know, we want to save the trees as well in the ocean. And we have to create something that's going to be safe for the environment. And I think that everybody has those storms in their life. Do something about it. You know, write stories, do something about it. Yeah, and also make people realize that actually don't don't think the problem is so vast that you can't do anything right. about it. I mean, I mean, you know, millions of small contributions will make a difference. I mean, again, the fact that this, you know, this one six month production, we left the environment in as good shape as we had gone there. We hadn't degraded it all. So there are those small victories, um, small things we can all do. And I just hope people don't don't give up hope and don't get so discouraged that they don't do you know do the kind of things that you're obviously doing to save forests and um you know i was one of those people for a long time i thought my contribution was you know sending a contribution to the causes and i thought that was and now i've realized that actually that's the easy way out so i have to start making some sacrifices and thinking a bit more seriously about you know, how I live my life, both as a, you know, as an individual and as a professional filmmaker. Yeah. I don't know how other viewers are watching the show, but on, on my, on, when I watch uh, the swarm on CW, my, my program comes with, with the, uh, with the subtitles and I've gone into, you know, to kind of disconnect it. It won't, it won't go away, but every one of my episodes have subtitles. Well, I think there's subtitles. Um, I'm assuming they're only for the foreign language, the sections with the characters oh. or they can Okay, maybe that's what I should be looking for. But no, I love it, though, because what it does is that, you know, because I want to know exactly what they say. I never want to assume when you've got this much drama, I want the exact words so that I can really dive into the story. Yeah, I think, but I'm not sure how the app works, but I think that well, there should be, a there is definitely the English language version, you can watch it with subtitles, but in the English language version, they'll also have the subtitles, you know, the, the scenes where a little bit of French, a little bit of yeah, Japanese. Yeah. We just think that anytime we had characters together whose native language was not English, it made more sense as scientists, they would speak that. Um, but I think there's there should be a way to, again, I don't do this part of it, but I think there should be a way to be able to uh, have no subtitles, lots of subtitles or just selected ones. I hope you find out. How <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I can't thank you enough for, for the swarm on, on CW. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. Well, I hope you'll have me back as soon as I come up with another show that um, you and your listeners might be interested in. I love thanks it. again. You be brilliant today, okay, Frank? Thanks. You take care. Bye-bye.